It is six miles from downtown Oakland to downtown San Francisco, across the bay. Today, a motorist can drive it via the San Francisco-Oakland Bay Bridge. It takes 30 minutes during the rush hour. He can fly over it via helicopter, but the cost is too great for most commuters. Ferry boats, unfortunately, are no longer practical. However, starting in 1972, more than 35,000 people will cross this barrier each morning quickly and economically in rapid transit trains running through an underwater tube on the floor of San Francisco Bay. Comfortably seated in ultra-modern vehicles, they will travel past the piers of the Bay Bridge, a hundred feet below the keels of cruising ships, and directly into the subway system of downtown San Francisco. At 80 miles per hour, the trip from the heart of Oakland to the center of San Francisco will take eight minutes. The engineering structure which will make this feat possible is the Trans Bay Tube, key link in the new San Francisco Bay Area rapid transit system. This is a photographic report on how engineers designed and built this facility, the longest, deepest underwater crossing of its type in the world. The San Francisco Bay Area Rapid Transit System is a 75-mile urban transportation system costing more than a billion dollars. Its purpose is to bind together the large metropolitan complex surrounding San Francisco Bay, a complex which includes San Francisco, Oakland, Richmond, and Berkeley. BART's greatest role will be that of carrying the crush of commuter traffic into these cities from a host of suburban communities. Its capacity, 30,000 seated passengers per hour in each direction. To create this kind of capacity, BART engineers are developing a variety of new mass transit concepts. Lightweight trains on wide gauge track, traveling at twice the speed of most transit systems. An automatic train control system in which an electronic computer will continuously control 450 transit vehicles or more on the 75 mile system. New ideas in power and propulsion. A self-service fare collection system. 37 passenger stations, 13 of which will be in new subway systems in San Francisco, Oakland, and Berkeley. And new standards in passenger convenience and comfort. A joint venture of three firms of international reputation was retained by the Bay Area Rapid Transit District to design the system, to write the specifications, and to manage construction. These three firms are Parsons, Brinkerhoff, Quaid, and Douglas, Tudor Engineering Company, and Bechtel Corporation, sponsor of the joint venture. This organization established a staff of 300 engineers and other experts working out of a central headquarters and 35 field offices to manage construction. Design of the tube was assigned to Parsons, Brinkerhoff, Quaid, and Douglas, which has had more experience in underwater crossings than almost any other organization in the world. PBQ&D designed and managed construction of the Hampton Roads crossing in Virginia, for example, and has developed sophisticated plans for a tube-type crossing of the English Channel. Design of the Transbay tube was a major undertaking, requiring the skills of several hundred engineers, experts in steel and concrete structural design, soils mechanics, marine construction, tunnel ventilation, and other specialties. More than three and a half miles long, the tube is three times longer than any other underwater crossing of the sunken tube design. It is located in fast-running tidal water at depths of 80 to 130 feet, and it follows an alignment which required two horizontal curves and six vertical curves. The tube is binocular in cross-section with two trackways, to carry transit trains running in opposite directions. These two trackways, 17 feet in diameter, 
are separated by large ducts to provide ventilation and to carry utilities. The designers were faced not only with the problem of creating a structure heavy enough to carry the BART trains across the soft foundation of the bay floor, but also to design for hydrostatic pressures and foreseeable earthquakes in the area. They met these criteria with a design calling for composite construction. Heavy steel framing encased in walls of reinforced concrete 27 inches thick and an exterior shell of continuously welded steel plate. The engineers designed the long underwater structure to be constructed in 57 individual sections. Each one measured 48 feet in width, 24 feet in height, and averaged 330 feet in length. These steel sections were fabricated on shipways on shore, launched, and then floated out to their proper position in the alignment and sunk into a trench gouged across the floor of the bay. The engineering assignment also included design of two large terminal and ventilation structures at which the tube would join underground subway lines leading into downtown Oakland and downtown San Francisco. The design task took three years. A joint venture of four contracting firms submitted a low bid of 89 million for basic construction. This venture operating under the name Transbay Constructors included Peter Kiewit Sons Company, Raymond International, Tidewater Construction Company, and Healy Tibbetts Construction Company. It was this firm's responsibility to build the long tube across the bay, a job which posed a fistful of problems in steel fabrication, in concrete forming, in dredging and screeding, in sinking of sections, and in survey control. Construction of the 330-foot long tube sections began in the Bethlehem Steel Company shipyard in San Francisco. Here, the contractor proceeded much as if he were building 57 ships, setting up mass production lines, and assembling the steel framework into larger and larger modules. These, in turn, were assembled into complete tube sections. The full-length sections were assembled on shipways upon completion. Bulkheads were installed in both ends to make them airtight. Launching took only 10 seconds, but it was always an exciting event. After launching, the sections were towed to a nearby wharf for outfitting. Here, the contractor placed 5,000 cubic yards of concrete into the section for an interior structural lining more than two feet thick and a trackway base three and a half feet thick. The engineers developed a pouring sequence to permit placing of concrete without overstressing elements of the tube structure and to keep it on an even keel. This schedule required the contractor to move the heavy steel forms back and forth within a section considerably from one end to another. He solved this problem by developing a highly mobile form handling machine and special reusable steel forms. This machine mounted on rubber wheels could move the full length of a 300 foot section to install or remove forms as needed. Right after launching, the watertight section floated high in the water. When 10,000 tons of concrete had been added, it had a freeboard of only two and a half feet. The contractor worked from both the Oakland side and the San Francisco side simultaneously, placing a tube section on one end or the other every two weeks. When a section was ready for sinking, it was towed out into the bay to another original construction rig, a lay barge. The lay barge was constructed like a catamaran, consisting of two railroad car floats connected by two steel girders. It was 366 feet long, almost the length of a city block. A system of lines and heavy anchors kept the barge in position over the tube alignment. To sink a floating tube section, it was pushed into position between the two rail barges, then lowered by means of heavy cables to the bottom of the bay. 
To start the sinking, the contractor merely loaded a ballast box on top of the section with gravel. The 300 foot long section was suspended from four points, two at each end. A sensitive system of hydraulic controls and strain gauges permitted operators to watch the load on all four points at once and keep the tube section level during the descent. This was delicate work, considering that the water was as much as 130 feet deep, the tidal currents swift, and the surface okay. rough. Start down. Yet the hydraulic system controlling the powerful deck engines was so precise, the contractor could control the longitudinal and transverse position of the sections to within one inch of center line. An artist's rendering shows the action out of sight below the white cap. Here is the 330-foot long tube section from the viewpoint of a diver descending into a 70-foot deep trench. The team on the lay barge became so efficient they could lower and connect a section in an hour. Surveyors worked on shore points and a tower mounted on each tube section to direct the lowering and placing operation. An optical plummet employed through a 16-inch vertical pipe enabled surveyors to align the center line of the tube with onshore control points. A diver was sent down to help connect the new tube section to the previously placed section. While the section was still on the shipways, four railroad car couplers had been installed at each end. Underwater, the divers connected these to couplers on the section already in place. At a signal, operators on the barge above could activate hydraulic rams connected to the couplers and draw the new section up tight to the old one. The water trapped between the rubber seals of the two sections was bled out, and the hydrostatic pressure on the outboard end of the tube jammed the seals tight. Then workmen inside the tube could cut away the bulkheads, weld the new section permanently to the structure in place, and grout the joint with concrete. Dredging the trench for three and a half miles across the bay before the tube could be placed was another unique operation. The contractor used both hydraulic and clamshell dredges, moving some five and a half million cubic yards of material in all. Specifications required placement of a two-foot course of gravel as a foundation course. The contractor was required to level this material to within three-fourths of an inch of grade. To meet this specification, a large and ingenious screening rig was built. It was designed as a floating platform for the placing of the foundation course and leveling by remote control. The screed barge floating on two pontoons stood 44 feet high and measured 85 feet wide, 240 feet long. It consisted primarily of an open rectangular frame built of trusses, 16 feet deep and 12 feet wide. On this structural steel framework, the contractor mounted a traveling bridge for moving the screed back and forth along the bottom of the trench. A system of anchors stabilized the entire rig in the water. Three large hoppers were also mounted on the traveling bridge with tubes to carry the foundation gravel down to the spreader box on the bed of the trench. The spreader itself was a steel frame hung on cables from the traveling bridge above. With this device, the contractor was able to produce the level foundation course required. The alignment of the tube changes both horizontally and vertically with several compound curves. Starting from the San Francisco side at minus 88 feet elevation, it first slopes downward, then up at a 2% grade to clear the rising floor off Yerba Buena Island, down again under a shipping channel, and up on a 3% grade to the Oakland side. A system of laser beams was set up to keep the job on proper line and grade. With beams visible for up to seven miles in either bright sunlight or total darkness. They were used to permit excavation of the trench to continue around the clock. The lasers were positioned on various onshore locations so that an engineer standing on the deck of a barge could tell within six inches if the dredging were proceeding on line and grade. The BART engineers designed large structures at both ends of the tube to serve as structural termini and to house utility, electrical power, and ventilating equipment. 
The structure on the San Francisco side was fabricated like the tube sections on a shipway, launched, floated into position, and sunk to the bottom like a caisson. The huge structure called for 3,700 tons of steel and 15,000 cubic yards of concrete. It measured 122 feet long by 68 feet wide and stood 40 feet high on the shipway at time of launching. Concrete was placed from ready-mix trucks for the walls and floors, and so the huge caisson sunk steadily to its prepared foundation on the bay floor. On completion, it was 10 stories high, all but 10 feet of which were below the water surface. Designing the caisson was a major assignment, considering the water pressure at the various stages of the sinking, the earth pressures at various stages of backfilling, the launching loads, floor loads, train loads, and finally any dynamic loads which might be imposed by earthquakes. Because it is founded 100 feet below the surface and embedded in 60 feet of mud, most of the load on the caisson will be exerted by lateral forces. These lateral loads will total as much as 90,000 tons per lineal foot. To withstand these forces, the designers specified a base slab and lower walls 12 feet thick. The structure is kept solidly in place by its 34,000 tons of concrete and steel. The terminal structure provides huge shafts leading to the surface through which the air building up in front of a fast moving train can be vented. It also contains fans for exhausting the tube in case of emergency. Providing seismic protection for the tube was a major concern for the designers. No fault runs through the bay. The San Andreas Fault passes offshore 10 miles to the west and the Hayward Fault eight miles to the east. However, engineers designed the structure with earthquake possibilities in mind. First, they planned the tube, much like a continuous flexible pipe. The steel shell was made fully continuous over the entire length of the tube by welding. Structural steel bridging across each joint will be able to resist the stresses and strains of an earthquake. The reinforced concrete walls, 27 inches thick, will give it structural integrity and sufficient weight to keep it in place. Another design consideration with earthquake possibilities in mind was location of the tube. The alignment was purposely chosen to locate the tube in the soft alluvial soils of the bay and to thus place it on a cushion which would absorb any shock through the area. This is possibly the only structure of comparable magnitude in which a principal aim of location and design was to avoid solid foundation material. A major soils testing program was undertaken to determine the characteristics of various soils under the bay. Some of this exploration was carried on over a six-year period in advance of final design decisions. In addition, a scale model of a section of the tube and the caisson and representative soils were tested on a large shaking table under simulated earthquake conditions. It was also realized that there would be considerable difference in the seismic effect upon the tube itself and the relatively rigid terminal structures at its ends. To provide for the differential movement between these two structures, the tube engineers designed a unique sliding joint. During an earthquake, this connection will permit the tube and the caisson on their different foundations to respond independently without damage. The joint will allow the tube to move in three directions, vertically, horizontally, and longitudinally. The severely corrosive effect of the soils to which the steel shell of the tube and offshore caisson will be exposed posed another problem. To offset this, the engineers designed a cathodic protection system, which made possible a saving of $2 million in the cost of heavier steel plate. Early one morning in April 1969, the 57th tube section was launched. A few weeks later, it was towed out to the last gap in the long alignment and sunk precisely into place. The event was celebrated with appropriate ceremony in commemoration of a project which had been nearly 10 years in the planning, design, and construction.
Sometime in the near future, BART trains will run through the tube for the first time, another milestone in civil engineering. From that date on, it will serve many generations of commuters. Out of sight, deep below the blue waters of San Francisco Bay, the Transbay tube will never win an award for aesthetic design. It will add no soaring structure to the skyline of this beautiful city. Yet, it will become part of the daily experience of millions of commuters. The fastest, easiest crossing of a large body of water in the history of transportation.